problem is, is that the reality that makes up the lion does not persist through time. It persists through, if it has any, if the, if the Buddhist atoms that make it up, allegedly make it up, have any persistence, persistence at all, it's going to be, you know, trillion, trillions of a second or less. So there is a huge problem with how our sense experience matches up with uh, Buddhist atomism and quantum reality. Okay, so, so okay. Okay, so let me continue on here then. Yes. <laughs> I'm told a lot of people are hearing us now, so. Okay, um, I was just wondering the five points that you had there. I sure. have a pretty good grasp on what they all okay. mean, but the term, the use of the term material throws me off a bit. I mean, oh, even okay, if great. they are fundamental, basic building blocks to say that something at that point is immaterial, I'm con Right, what okay. Is, I mean, what is the description? I'm going to cover that, but material. I'm going to do that right now. Um, The, if you uh, just go and look, it's merely a definition issue, a word issue, semantic issue. If you go and look at uh, the history of the definition of matter, matter is defined in the following ways. Um, you know, just start describing the wall. It's got a surface, and it, in other words, an extension. Um, it is stable. It's not fl flipping in and out of existence. It is colorful. It has a location in space. Uh, it's solid, and so forth. Just, you know, so, though, if that's what matter is, then there's a problem because um, this stuff doesn't have any of those qualities. It has the opposite. So, if matter is solid, stable, extended, located in space, it persists through time. If something has the inverse of all those properties, I have to call it non-matter. You see what I mean? So I have uh, another question then. Would you define the materialistic point of view? In other words, if I looked at that materialistically, what would that oh. mean? Uh, I mean, there's no... Uh, the other reason I call this immaterial, and this is not, this is not my choice, this is, there are, this is a, a movement that some physicists and philosophers are onto, you know, to, to say that subatomic particles, Buddhist atoms are, we don't see how they're material items. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. They have the inverse properties of the material items, so how can we call them material? If, if there's a, uh, um, an apple sitting over there, and it's red and round and tastes like an apple, those are three properties. If an orange is sitting next to it, and it's orange, and has a different roundness and doesn't taste apple-like, I can't call it an apple. Its properties being different mean I have to call it a different thing. So if, if something has all the properties that matter doesn't have, I don't know how I have to call it non-matter. That would seem to be the definition of, of well, immaterial. Well, immaterial. What would you think of, of suggesting that um, is immaterial which has no substrate? You mean in the philosophic sense of Aristotle and so forth? I don't know about Aristotle, I just mean in the physical sense that all the, what we would associate with being material would be that there, it is upon something, within something, it has a substrate. Yeah, but you're suggesting that, I think, that this has no substrate. When you use the word substrate, that has a specific, I think that you're using it the same way as I'm thinking, that's a specific meaning to philosophers, meaning that there is, behind the properties, is a property holder. Something that reveals the properties. Yeah. yeah. That is, um, Buddhist atomism is part of a tradition across the world. Uh, it goes from anywhere from William James to the logical positivists to um, it's the philosopher Quine, uh, all over the place where we reject substrate uh, because of its metaphysicality. What that means, what I mean by that is we have no evidence that substrate exists. Uh, it just seems to be that we come into the world, a world of properties, whiteness, solid, so forth, um, and therefore our, the way we think makes us say, okay, if there's a property of something, 
then there has to be a something that we don't see, an invisible something. Uh, that's the substrate. It's often called a bare particular, or a thin particular. Or th you know, there's all kinds of names philosophers, metaphysicians have. The philosophers who study metaphysics have for these. Uh, but I'm part of a tradition that rejects this, and I don't reject this just by choice. I published several articles that are savage attacks against the philosophy of property possession. Uh, the best one is the one that's coming out later this year in the journal called Sorties, called Blob Theory. Um, but uh, so to sum up, your, to answer your question in a real quick summary, there's two reasons. We have no evidence that substrate exists, but let's just say, who cares? Let's just theorize that it does. There's this stuff behind the properties that holds the properties. If you start to try to describe it, you run straight into what philosophers often call it, is a train wreck. How about just using difference, then? Difference? Yeah. Oh, well, difference where, where is exactly... There's no, where there's no difference, there's oh, no materiality. Difference. Say again? Where there is no difference, mm -hmm. there is what we would call immateriality. Oh, well, there is no difference, there is immateriality. You would have to then explain how, do you, what you have as being not difference, do you have in mind it persists through time, for example? Okay, and the point I'm trying to get is as soon as you try to describe it as existing through time, for example, or entering into causal relations if it does, or, you know, or being eternal, uh, I could show you if we had time that it leads to uh, big problems. In other words, the descriptions lead to absurdity. And that's not just my opinion, again, this is what I've shown elsewhere and anything I've written. I'm just thinking <clears throat> one thing. I was talking to several people with the string theory, which, you know, it just kind yep. of interests me on the side, but <clears throat> as far as I understand with the strings, there is no no connection between the strings. So right. if you took the, you know, ultimately, let's take that picture. Mm -hmm. So there is no connection between the strings. Mm -hmm. And there may be, I don't know about temporal evolution, if there's a connection. So if you think that there's no connection, which is this picture, I guess, mm -hmm. which is interesting because I was, I mentioned connection at the beginning, which I think, mm -hmm. term, I think, yeah, there is. Uh -huh. but, but at the mm -hmm. other level, no connection. So no connection is, pretty good because in that sense the surface is is a manifestation and an assumption of connection mm -hmm. but, um, yeah I, actually that's something I'm going to go into here in a second uh, but just to give you a hint the idea of connection is really sort of in the Buddhist tradition I'm thinking of is sort of replaced by the concept of indistinguishability any Buddhist atom is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from any other. So if you see one here and one there, they're indistinguishable. Of course, any. Pardon? No, like Pauli exclusion principle. The let's say you know like process of an atom. Mm-hmm. I forgot what that is. Well, they can they can adopt exactly the same set of quantum numbers. Oh. Set an energy level quantum numbers. So. Yeah, that would be. Th that would be rejected in Buddhist atomism. Um, so, but uh, I mean, it, just as there's, I mean, we also have, we have, it, it, as far as I can tell, there's confusion in quantum physics about exactly how to, what to do about electrons. They seem to be more or less identical, except for certain uh, uh, issues like is, is location, for example. But location depends on the existence of space, which is invisible. There's not a person in here that's ever seen space, so you know it's it's un. Know what the micron is ultimately, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our best uh, theory for what these things are is is uh, Buddhist atomism, um, and uh, but yeah, as far as the Pauli exclusion principle, yeah, something like that would be rejected. There, there is tech, I mean, if you, these two statements would both be true in Buddhist atomism. Uh, there's only one atom, and the infinite instances of atoms which are all indistinguishable. So both of those would be. Uh, so the, the the real mystery in Buddhist atomism is if, if there's this sea of, of Buddhist atoms, how what do they do, uh, and how can they uh, give rise to the appearance of the reality we see? Which there's, I've made some preliminary work on that, but that's what I'm working on right now. Um, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Um, you use the example of. Uh, Quarks and uh -huh. electrons as being examples of Buddhist atoms. Yeah, uh, right. But a, an electron has mass, so wouldn't it? The fact that it has mass, some measurable mass that physicists, scientists have measured, can measure, 